Great. All right, so welcome back. Um, for this lecture, we're going to go a little deeper into Express, how Express actually works, and then we'll start talking about REST. So you may have heard that term, and it's a way to structure an API. <laughs> so Express middleware. Believe it or not, you've already been using middleware, and you actually coded a few middleware functions yourself. What is it? Um, an Express app is essentially just a chain of middleware functions. So if you notice, like you could pass one to the other, and we'll talk about that in depth. So middleware functions have all have access to the request object, uh, which you used a little bit today, the response object, which you used today with res.send and stuff, and then the next middleware function in the chain. And if you want to read about using it, uh, there's a link. <clears throat> and so express middleware can get mounted onto a path, which means they listen at like a specified path, just like app.get slash. So that's an example of middleware that's listening at slash. Uh, or it can listen globally, um, which means for every single request that comes in, it passes through that middleware. Um, middleware can also modify the request to response objects. So if you want to do something like um, injecting an uh, ID into the request or something, you can do that uh, and then just keep passing the control on. And then they can pass the control to the next middleware by invoking its callback. Um, and then any middleware can complete a response. And if it does that, then it kind of breaks the chain. And so an example of breaking or completing the response is that res.send function. So if you send the response back, then you no longer have to keep accessing things in the chain because the response has already been sent. Though you can still um, keep accessing things in the chain. Um, but warning, if you never send a response, the request will hang. So that's the bug that we had earlier when we did console.log high, but never actually sent high back. That was just the request hanging because it never received a response. And so what are the different types of middleware? There are the built-in ones. Um, I'll show a few examples in a bit. Uh, Third-party ones, so anything you install via the NPM packages. Application level or router level, which includes the app.get, app.post, app.delete, app.put. Um, and so you've used these a little bit. And the difference between application level and router level is that you can create separate router objects so that if you have like a thousand endpoints, you don't have it all in one file. You can put, split them into a few different files just so it's easier to manage. And then error handling. Um, you may have noticed that if you had an error like you did res.send zero, then you got a big callback or a big um, stack, an error stack that got returned to you. But in production, you probably don't want the user to get like your error stack if your um, server errors. And so you can have error handling functions that take care of that automatically. They notice that if there's an error in any of the functions, they'll say, oh, there's an error. What should I do? And you can choose to send like, oh, sorry, there was an error on my server without sending them a big stack. Um, another thing with error handling, it also allows you to create custom 404 pages or stuff like that. Um, and now RESTful services. So let's, let's actually take, before we break into RESTful services, let's t take a look at some examples of middleware. <coughs> so this is actually an API that I wrote for this class. We'll dive into it a lot more in depth starting tomorrow. But we can start to read the code even though we might not be able to write the code yet. So let's go to the top. So at the top you see I'm doing a lot of importing. Um, const is another thing introduced in ES6, which is the same thing as var or let, but it creates a variable that can't be changed. Because you probably don't want to change anything that you import because it might break things. And so by using const, that just ensures if I accidentally change any of things, these things, it'll throw an error. Um, so you see I'm including express, I have path, favicon, logger, cookie parser, body parser. These are all NPM packages that I've imported and we'll start to use them. That way I don't have to rewrite functions that will parse a body or parse the cookie or log things to the console. Um, and so you see config and a bunch of controllers that I've defined, which is just me separating out code so I don't have to write everything in one long file. And then you see at line 16, a line that you would recognize, var app equals express. We're creating that app. And then var router gets express router. That's just me 
um, splitting things off into different functions. Well, on line 20 is where we see our first middleware function. <coughs> App.use, express.static, path.join, durname, public. What the heck does that mean? Does anybody have any guesses? So you see the words static and public. And then you see path join, directory name, and public. So what, what does that kind of hint at? Yeah. Yeah, very close. So um, I don't know if you guys have talked about MVC. We won't talk about it until later in the course. But essentially, all of your static assets will go into this folder that we called public. Because we don't want the user to be able to say, grab this file, right, if they request it from the server. We don't want to send them our backend code. But there are things that we may want to send, like a CSS file or like images or stuff like that. And this is saying um, use express.static means serve static assets from the folder public, which means if I request like CSS slash um, style.css, if I have a CSS folder within public and within that folder, there's a file called um, style.css, it will just serve that rather than having to run through all this logic. And so that's built into Express, and it's middleware that takes care of that for you, rather than you having to have a separate router for every single possible thing within public. And then we see declaring third-party middleware. So app.use, 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 we see that a lot. What do you think that means? Exactly. So app.use just means mount this middleware at the global path, meaning for every single request that comes in, run it through this middleware first. Um, and so we see body parser.json, which just parses the body for JSON and creates it into a rec.body rec um, variable for you. That way you don't have to go through and parse the JSON. Um, and then you see a bunch of other things. Cookie parser probably parses cookies. Um, but the nice thing is it's all abstracted away from you. You don't have to worry about it. And then she router level middleware, which looks like some code that we've written before. We see router.route slash users dot get a couple things. I did not say hey Siri. Um, dot post. So what do you think that might mean? So router.route then slash users. We didn't, might not know what router.route means, but we do know what slash users probably means, right? Any guesses? Yeah. yeah, so if the user or if the client requests slash users, then it's going to run one of these two functions, either get or post. Um, and then it'll pass on to some other middleware that I wrote in a different file. But this is just a bunch of different endpoints that I'm defining here. But if I were to write the callback function here, this function could get, or this uh, script could get really, really long, and adding to it might get a little bit painful. And then we see application level middleware. So app.use slash router. Can anybody figure out what that means? So we see up here we define router and add to it a bunch of different routes. Any guesses to what line 75 does? Yeah. Yeah, it means dispatch to the router. And so. It's saying, I'm not going to handle it in this application, but that router object is holding all of the different routes. And so that will dispatch to whatever controller it wants to be. But what if it isn't found? Then we hit line uh, 78, which is handle 404. Does anybody know what 404 means? HTTP status? Not found, yeah. So if the page isn't something we defined, I just create a new error that's called not found with the status of 404 and then passes on to the error handling middleware. And so one thing that's different about error handling middleware is it actually takes four parameters, um, one of them being that error object. <coughs> and so I've defined a couple different error handlers, one for development and one for production, uh, something you don't have to really worry about right now. But the only difference between the two is it takes that error in and then just does res.status, so it defines a status, 
It's either going to be something that was defined up there, whatever gets passed into it. So like here we define it at line 80, we say the status is 404. So this would be a 404 error. If there's no error here, then we'll just call it a 500, which means what? Does anybody know? A 500 error? Yeah, internal server error, meaning the server threw an error, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. And so we're abstracting that away and not telling the client what went wrong on our end. And so we just said, hey, sorry, there's a 500 error. Send. We've seen res.send, and it just sends a message. What message are we sending? Nothing. So the user doesn't know what went wrong. And then you see this stuff that you've seen before, um, app.listen at a config.port, which just means create our server. Um, so this is the router function that I wrote for an API. This is an entire API. Um, and if you see, it's just a bunch of chaining middleware. So at the top of the file, we have some middleware like app.use, um, the express static at public. So if we're requesting something from the public directory, then try that. If that doesn't work, then run it through the body parser, run it through the parser again, run it through the cookie parser, and then run it through the router. And what happens if we don't find something in the router? Then throw a 404 error and pass that to the error handlers down here. So do you see how it's just a chain of error handlers or handlers and just passes it down, down, and down until eventually one of them returns a, st um, a response? Does that make sense? At least on a conceptual level? Are there any questions? No? Okay, you'll get a lot of hands-on experience with this in just a little bit. All right, RESTful services. Has anybody heard of the word REST? Or what it might be associated with? So REST stands for Representational State Transfer. Um, and what it is, is it's an architectural design pattern for APIs. Meaning it, it's a set of constraints that if the constraints are followed, you'll have an API that is easy to use by a client because it's the way that a lot of APIs are structured. So like Facebook has a REST API, Twitter has a REST API. Um, and a lot of places have internal REST APIs where uh, from within the company they can call their own API, but it might not be exposed to the public. <coughs> um, and so it's stateless. Does anybody know what the word stateless is? It's a word we threw around a little bit in CS50. Anyone? It just means that the server doesn't keep track of what's happening with each individual user, and that every single request co that comes in has enough information that the server will be able to craft together a, a response and send it back. Um, they're simple, they're scalable, which means they're also easy to add to and maintain. And the server <coughs> transfers state, like by returning an object, based on the client's request for an identifier, the identifier being that endpoint, like slash users or slash get coin flip, um, and an operation like the HTTP method. And so there are a few constraints, those being it's state list, there are descriptive messages, uh, there are consistent resource identifiers, client server, and cacheable. What the heck do these mean? So state lists I talked about earlier just means the user context isn't stored on the server. Meaning if a user makes one request and then another request, the server didn't remember the last request. It just responds to whatever request comes in based on what they ask for. And so that means that each request must contain enough information for the server to know what it should do. Like get users should grab a user and return it. But if I said like get this user and then my next question is um, append from that user, I won't remember what that user was because I'm stateless. Does that make sense? Descriptive messages uh, is just goes along with being stateless. It means that every single request that comes in or response contain enough information that either side knows what should be done with that request or response. Uh, consistent resource identifiers, that's just a fancy way of saying that you should have an organized way of being able to fetch any objects. And so we're pairing an endpoint with a method, and together that determines what I should do with your response. Um, so some examples of those are like here. 
<coughs> so I have this route called slash users. And so that will have something to do with the users object. Um, we can either get users, which the callback is users slash get all users. We can post users. And so post is another HTTP method. And the action associated with that is generally creating a new whatever. And so if we do have slash users and we're posting to that, that means that we'll be creating a new user. Um, and what if we want to update a user? That's usually put. And so if you see over here, we have slash users slash ID, which means not a general user, but this specific user. What do we want to do? We want to update that user. Um, and if we have get slash user slash ID, that means rather than getting all of the users, get a particular user. Um, another thing would be delete. So the delete HTTP method does exactly what it sounds like. It's a request to delete that object. And so we have the slash user slash ID, which identifies a particular user, and the delete method will delete that user. And so we have the same thing for other objects. So like a coupon object, you can either get slash coupons, which means rather than getting a particular coupon, get all of them. We can have slash coupon slash ID, which identifies a single coupon. And by getting that, you'll get a single coupon. You can post to coupons, which creates a general coupon, because you can't you can't um, do you can't create slash coupon slash ID because that object already exists. Um, and so posting to coupons would create a new coupon. Um, by getting coupon slash ID gets that particular coupon, then posting to that is something different. Putting to that put is another HTTP method, and what it does is it's a request to update that. And so by doing put slash coupon slash ID, that's a request to update that object. And then again, delete will delete it. Any questions on like how to structure generally the API? So what are the four HTTP methods that are important? Get, post, push, or put, and delete. So those are the four ones that you'll see most often. <coughs> All right, the next um, constraint is client-server, which just says there should be a separation between the clients and the server. The clients will be running their application, doing whatever they want to do, and when they feel a need to get information, they will send a request to the server. Um, and it, the clients don't share resources with the server. They just run their own thing and will request information as they need it. Um, and the server is just there. It's awaiting requests, and it'll handle any requests that are made to it. But it's not actively asking, like, hey, do you want me to send you a coupon? No, the client has to request it first. Uh, cacheable, it just means the responses have to have some sort of identifier with them that identifies, like, the current version of the data. And so if you add more data, then the previous, like, get all of these things is now expired, right? Because there are new things in the database. Um, and so this prevents clients from unnecessarily re-requesting the same data or from using expired data. And so that is a REST API and the general um, setup for one. Does anybody have questions about how you would generally set up an API? None? Uh, does everybody have a clear idea of how HTTP and requests on the internet work? Yeah, definitely. So I don't have any slides prepared for that, but I'll do it on the whiteboard. So what is HTTP? What does it stand for? Does anybody know? Hypertext. And that just kind of defines a protocol of sending information back and forth via the internet. So the internet is a word we all throw around a lot, but does anybody know what it actually is? Close. All it is is a huge interconnected network. And so when we say go look something up on the internet, we're actually referring to the web. So there's a dif distinction between the web and the internet. The internet just refers to the hardware and like the interconnectivity of all of these computers and routers and any nodes, while the web is referring to the web pages that we request and grab. And so 
the HTTP is one of the protocols that we use in order to communicate over the internet, the network. And so the way we do this, a request typically looks like this. So we have HTTP version, um, a location, a method, and a path. <coughs> so HTTP version, you don't have to worry about. It just tells the internet what version of HTTP to use. Location is very important. That determines where you're sending the request. So google.com is a location. But locations are actually translated into IP addresses, though that's outside of the scope of what you need to know. You just need to know that the location is where you're sending the request. So whether it be google.com, facebook.com, your own computer via localhost, um, that just is saying we send the request over to this general server. And then we have a method and a path. So these are what we play with within our API that we write. The method is saying like get, put, put uh, post, delete, headers, whatever. There are a bunch of HTTP methods and then a path. And the path determines where it's telling the server, hey, serve me this file. So it might be slash, which is get the home page, or it might be slash uh, flip coin, or any of the things that we defined above. It might be slash as diff, which might be, not be something that we define on the server. So that might return 404, which is the server saying, hey, you requested this, but I did not find that object. Yeah? So how does uh, node.js follow its own Does it help you with or? So node.js node is an engine that is running on each individual server. So if you, could, if you think about the internet, it's just a network. Um, and maybe this is uh, google.com, or let's say netflix.com. So I think Netflix uses Node.js. And us. And so when we send a request, we send it via HTTP along this network. And then we don't know what technology is running on Netflix.com server. It might be Node.js. It might be PHP. It might be Python. It might be Ruby on Rails. We have no idea. We just know that we requested it, and we're going to wait for data. And so that's that client-server separation. We don't care what technologies are running on Netflix's server. We just send a request, and we await a response. And so node.js is how Netflix.com internally um, decides what to send back via this uh, request. But HTTP is kind of a separate thing. It's the protocol that we use to request and receive objects. But um, each server decides what to send back via the code that's running on their server, whether it be Node.js or some other technology. OK, so Node.js is the only way that JavaScript can be accessible via an HTTP request? Or um, like what, I guess what's the, like what's the reason we have to just run it on our computers versus just like, how does JavaScript usually, I guess, become accessible by the web? OK, so I'll have an analogy for you. So say. I'm here, and my friend is across the country. And I'm like, man, I'm really having trouble with math. I don't remember what 8 plus 8 is. So I call my friend, hey, yo, do you know what 8 plus 8 is? And he's like, oh, yeah, it's 16. I'm like, oh, sweet. Do I really care about how he figured out what 8 plus 8 was? Maybe he pulled out a calculator. Maybe he Googled the answer. Maybe he did like some counting, whatever. I don't really care. All I did is I asked a question, and I got a response. And so in that analogy, Node.js might be a calculator. So maybe he used the calculator to calculate 8 plus 8. But maybe he just did it in his head, or maybe he used some other, other technology. I don't really care as the end user. Yeah? Can you use JavaScript, is it just JavaScript on each branch to, to handle the request? Is Node.js just a set of functions that make it easy? Node.js is a JavaScript engine. And so. Um, it's a way that the server can run JavaScript. Because historically, JavaScript was only a language that ran on browsers. And it was only a language that you could use on the client side. And it wasn't until 2009, with the invent of Node.js, that servers could actually run JavaScript code. 
And so Node.js is, you can think of it as like an interpreter of JavaScript, and it allows the server to understand the JavaScript code that you write. Because you have like C, like if you took CS50, you did a lot of C, and how do you get C to run? You have to compile it. And so there are Clang and GCC and other compilers that allow you to turn C into machine code that the machine can understand. And so that's the process of compilation. And then the machine on bare metal can understand that machine code and run whatever you wanted it to do. And so JavaScript is another language that the server just doesn't know what to do, right? If, it's like if I didn't speak Chinese and somebody told me something in Chinese, I wouldn't know what he meant unless I spoke that particular language. And Node.js empowers servers to speak JavaScript. Mm -hmm. uh, over, like, Ruby on Rails or Flash. Okay, so repeating for the microphone, the question is, what's so great about Node.js anyway? Um, one huge advantage of it is that it empowers what used to be only front-end engineers to also write uh, back-end code. So it created, like, the modern full-stack developer. Because in CS50, you did a little bit of, like, Python and then JavaScript as well, right? And so every time you change something on your back end, you have to be like, oh, shoot, I've been using JavaScript all day. Let me context switch and remember how to code Python and start coding in Python. And said, oh, now I need to request that using Ajax. Oh, shoot, how do I do Ajax again? I got to context switch, switch and remember how to start coding JavaScript. And with Node.js, since you use the same language on both the front end and back end, it removes that, um, the, like, it's no longer necessary to speak multiple languages in order to write a whole website. You can do the whole thing in JavaScript, whether it's the front end or the back end. And so that's one huge advantage. Um, another big advantage is that it's very, very, very fast. And since it's asynchronous, it can dispatch requests and then start working on like a, bu a bunch of other requests. So say I have 100,000 requests coming in at once. I could say, oh, this request, go do that. This, go do that. This, go do that. And I don't have to wait for this request to return before hitting the next request. And other languages, like I believe PHP, it's not asynchronous, so it has to finish one request by before getting to the other one. I'm not 100% sure about that, but I'm fairly sure. Um, and so there are a lot of stories about companies that used to use one technology switching to uh, Node.js and being able to uh, handle a lot more requests. The biggest one being, I think, Walmart. So Walmart, around three or four years ago, they used to use PHP on the back end. And on Black Friday, every single year their servers would crash because there's so many requests coming in that the server just gets overloaded and can't handle all this, the requests. And then I believe three or so years ago, they said, all right, I've heard Node.js is so great. Let's just try writing our servers in Node.js. And so they've made that switch. And then Black Friday, I think it was like 40% more users actually came to their site and their servers never even hit 5% of the capacity. And so it just allows... It's so asynchronous and it's super quick, and so it allows um, servers to handle a lot more requests than maybe other stacks do. Yeah, any other questions? All right, so, H so back to this. HTTP is the protocol that allows requests and responses to um, know what they're supposed to be doing. And so um, our backend will parse this HTTP uh, request and decide what we want to do based on what we write in our code. Does that make sense? Cool. So when we go to the browser and just say www.google.com, what does this request look like? We don't care about HTTP version for now. What's the location? <coughs> Google.com, which will later get translated to an IP address, but we don't really care about that. What's the method? Get. And what's the path? Yeah, slash root. Um, so what happens if we want to do a delete method? Can we do that in a browser? Not really. So every time we go to the address bar and hit enter, it's automatically a get request. And there's not really a way that you can say, actually, I want to make that a post request. Or actually, I want to make that a delete request. Um, and so when you're using HTML form and you submit the form, 
that's one way for whoever supplied the form to say, actually, I want that form on submit to be a post request or a delete or a put request. But there's not really an easy way for a user to just say, hey, I actually want to request this endpoint with this method, at least not in a browser. And so there are a couple ways to do it. One would be using um, a command line utility called curl. Um, it's a notoriously difficult program to use, but it allows you to make very, very customized requests. Another one is software that you may have installed this morning called Postman. And so Postman <coughs> it allows you to make a request URL and then choose any of the HTTP methods that you want to use. And so say I want to get www.google.com, I can just say www.google and say I want to get request and send that request. And what comes back? This thing, um, which is what? Yes, the Google homepage, most likely. Um, I could like paste this into an HTML, HTML page and open it, and it's most likely going to be Google's homepage. What happens if we try to delete www.google.com? <laughs> Error method not allowed. And so they said, hey, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> right? And so they return a status 405 method not allowed. And so. Um, in an HTTP uh, response, a lot of times a method is associated with those as well, or a status code, and the status codes match up with um, like the response status. So what are some popular status codes that you may have heard of? So we discussed earlier 404. Not found. Yep, 200, which means success. OK. What else? 403. Unauthorized. Um, 500. Internal server error. Uh, what about 405? Um, so the big ones you need to know are 200 OK, uh, 404 not found, 500 internal server error, 403 unauthorized, 400 um, invalid request. Um, 401 is another way to say unauthorized, pretty much. Um, but these are the big ones you need to know. 200, 400, 404, and I guess 500, though hopefully you will never have to use that. Um, but that's a way of associating a status with the response. And so in Node.js, we have a way to explicitly set that, and I'll show you that in a little bit. Does anybody have any conceptual questions up to this point? Anything at all? Do you have a fairly good understanding of how a backend server functions? Cool. So what does, so you guys tell me, what exactly, how does is a REST API um, organized? We have a method and an object, pretty much or some sort of identifier. Identifier. Um, and so the method determines what you want to do to that identifier. So it could be get, it could be post, it could be put, it could be delete, or anything else. And so what will get generally do? Exactly what it sounds like. Yeah, it'll, it'll get whatever identifier we're querying for. Um, what about post? It 
is a request to create. What about put? Huh? Yeah. Um, update. Um, what about delete? Delete. Let's change this to request. Um, and so those are generally the four um, actions that we would do upon a certain object. Has anybody heard of the word CRUD? Not used like in a slang term, but with databases? Um, C R U D. And so that's what it means when you said it's a CRUD database. It's a database that can handle these um, actions. Um, and so those are the methods. What are the object identifiers? Generally, they're plural um, nouns. So if you have a bunch of objects or a bunch of users, maybe it's slash users. Um, or really, like, essentially pluralized, pluralized whatever object you're requesting for. We'll get the general one, and what if you want a specific one? You tack on an identifier, generally an ID. And so if you look at the code over here, it roughly matches up to this. We have uh, get users, we'll get all users, post users, we'll create a user, and so on. And then at line 42, we see slash user slash colon ID. Uh, any guesses to what the colon means? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So if we define in any router, so if we do like an app.get or app.post or router.route, any of these things that create an uh, endpoint, um, if we do colon something, it will actually store this in rec.params. So if you do Uh, so let's look at an example of that in code. <coughs> so I'm going to just edit the code that we wrote this morning. So say we have app.get flip coin. Actually, let's do app.get get coin state um, slash um, hello and function and all it does is res.send rec.params.hello So what do we think that's going to do? <coughs> it essentially means if we visit slash get coin state, fire this. Well, if we do get coin state slash something else, whatever follows after that slash, before the next slash, gets put into hello. And then we can feel free to use that variable in the program. And so that's how we grab the IDs from uh, a URL like that. And so if we run get coin state slash hello, it'll send hello back to us. And so let's try that. So if we visit get coin state, it will presumably get the coin state. Um, and if we visit slash, it echoes that back to us. And so that's how we set variables, or we grab variables from the URL. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Oh, we could do this. So now whatever we do, slash, slash, it will echo, I didn't run it. Ugh. It will echo that back to us with a space in between. Make sense? Does anybody have any questions so far? Yeah. For it, um, like colon ID is like the two words in C. Mm -hmm. like add an L. Rec dot params in the middle. Yep, so that allows us rec dot params dot ID. And so if we had did oh. colon something else, it would be rec dot params dot something else. Okay, so we did like rec dot params dot name, and it would be like colon name equals mm -hmm. L. Exactly. Um, and so let's go ahead and whiteboard code the assignment from earlier. So now that we know how to do this, how would we actually do the thing where if we visit slash A, it'll print out 1? <coughs> One more thing I didn't mention. Um, has everybody, anybody heard about regular expressions or what they are a little bit. So it's a way of pattern matching on strings. Um, and so the quick rundown is question mark makes the preceding thing optional. Um, star means the preceding thing can happen as many times as you need. Um, dot is a wild card. And then Actually, this is not necessary. Let's do it without that. Um, so, so let's do app dot get um, slash what? Letter. Yep. And then a function uh, that takes ref res ref. I'm using squiggle notation for saving space. Um, then what? So this does exactly what we did before. It'll echo any single path back to us. There's a bug. There are a few bugs. So what happens if we visit slash letter? Then it prints letter, right? But we only want it to work for lowercase letters. So how do we do that? Um, yes, but before that, this could be a whole string, right? So how do we make sure it's only a single letter? Yeah. So if rec.params.length, what? Greater than one. Return whatever. Bad. Um, then what? Yeah, so then we have to check if it's a letter. <coughs> How do we do that? Yeah. Yeah, 
so shortcut var l equals rec. This should, there should be a dot letter in here too. Dot params dot letter. Then we could do if l, l dot length is greater than one, whatever. Um, then do what you're saying if l dot get. What's the function? I forget what it's called. Charcoal. Get char code is less than ninety seven. Or we could do this. That way, if the char code of A changes, we're not screwed. Um, if it's less than that, or or the same thing with Z, and this is the other way. Um, then, bad. Else, what? Yeah, res dot send rec or l dot get char code minus a dot get char code plus one and then cast that to a string and then return it. Which is easier, this or doing the closure? Yeah, about the same. What's particularly buggy about this? So now let's visit app.get slash flip coin, what happens? Yeah, this catches it first. Then it's like, nope. All right, let's uh, get the coin state. Nope. So this will actually grab every single request and pretty much reject everything. Um, how would we remedy that? Just put everything else first. Uh, because if you remember, it's a chain. And whatever catches first will get executed first. Another way would be to use regex here. Um, I'll let you explore that on your own, because it's definitely not necessary for anything that we do. <coughs> um, and another way would be to use the third argument. So the callback actually takes three arguments, res, rec, rec, res, and next. And next will pass the control to the next function. Um, so you could actually just do, if this, then you could say next. And it'll go execute whatever's next in the chain. Make sense? So I drew a bunch of X's here, which meant reject the request. But what's the right way to actually reject a request? Do you guys mind if I erase? Actually, I'll just do it in code. I could have done this in code. Dang. Then we could have actually tested it. Um, So say we wanted uh, flip coin half the time to actually just error. Uh, so we could do var did error gets this. And then if it did error, then we can error. So how do we respectfully say 404 not found. 
we can actually do that manually by doing uh, which of the two are we probably going to use? Request or re response. We're sending response, so it'll most likely be res dot something. Um, and if you look up the documentation, you would see that there is something called status, which allows you to manually set the status. And so we could say 404, and then dot send, we'll send it, and we can say, sorry, it didn't work. Um, what's wrong with this? Can anybody see a possible problem? Can you guys read that? Should I make it bigger? <coughs> so what happens if it does error? We run res.status404.send, sorry it didn't work. Then what happens? Yeah, if you're the JavaScript interpreter, you run that line of code and they say, all right, what's next? Coin state gets this, you flip the coin, and then you try to res.send again. So this will actually error in some cases. Um, so flip coin, do we call it? Sorry, it didn't work. Uh, I guess it didn't error. It should have erred. Uh, it should complain, sorry, we can't set these headers after it's already been sent. Um, well, I guess it's because we didn't send header, set headers. But it's trying to resend a request that's already been sent. And so that is uh, error. And so how do we remedy that? How do we say exit after we've done something? Mm -hmm. So that. By saying return res.status404.send, it means, all right, this function is now done. We've returned from the function, so stop running any more code. And so if you want to do an early return, that's how to do it. You say return this, and then the function will stop executing. And so similarly, we can send a 500 error by just doing this. If we want to be really explicit down here, we could do res.status. 200 dot send, um, but that's overly explicit. Any questions? Yeah. So the empty res dot send sends like just nothing. Nothing. Okay. Um, there's actually a shortcut. You can do res dot send status. 200, and it'll send was generally like the string with 200, which is OK. And if you do res.send status 404, it would say not found, or whatever is the um, default string for that particular, oh, I erased it, but uh, response, HTTP response code, status code. Any questions? All right, fun assignment coming up. Um, so we'll end early the lecture so that you have time to uh, do the assignment because it's a little bit of a long one, but definitely, definitely very fun. And so I'll talk you through it a little bit. So you guys with your partners, which will be randomly decided again, get to write your own REST API. Uh, one quick question. Um, was the API that we wrote earlier today, was that a REST API? Is this a REST API? And why or why not? <coughs> so does anybody remember some of the state, the um, requirements for a REST API? There's one requirement that it's just blatantly breaking. And it's the one that, this one? 
because we have this coin, a coin object, and when we ask to do op uh, actions on the object, we just throw random endpoints. We have slash get coin state, slash flip coin, and in no way does it actually fit this um, organization method. And so how do we restructure this such that it more fits what's generally a REST, REST full service? So we have an object, right? We have coin. And so how would we get the coin state? So what would we change get coin state to be? Yeah, exactly. So get slash coin, get coin state should actually be uh, get slash coin, where coin is the object. Uh, generally, we would have coins, but since there are only ever one coin, we could just use coin. How about flip coin? First of all, should it be a get request? What? Who, somebody said something? Yeah, exactly. So put request, right? Because we are updating the coin state. Albeit randomly, we're still doing a put what? Slash coin. If we did slash coin slash flip, that implies that there's a flip object that we should theoretically be able to get post delete. But it's really just this coin, right? By putting coin, we're updating the coin state. Um, now these aren't really applicable because we don't create new coins or delete, but this is what we should have used the endpoints for endpoints over there if we wanted to make this more fit the rest uh, architectural pattern. Does that make sense? Yeah? Is it just a convention that you use it, or is there actually like technical difference between the conventions? Absolutely no difference. Um, that's a lie. Uh, there is a difference. Uh, get versus post, what's the difference there? We talked about it in CS50 a little bit. Do you like send stuff with the post? Yeah, so post has a body, whereas get doesn't. So post has a body where we usually put our form, and get, if we want to pass anything, we do like question mark query equals cats, right? Like if you do google.com question mark query equals cats, it'll search cats for you. And so that's how we pass queries to coin. Uh, you can do the same thing with a post request, but with a post request, you might as well just stick it in the request body. And so that's... That's why if you fill out a form online and submit a request, it doesn't go to like facebook.com slash login question mark username equals this, password equals this, right? That would be pretty unsafe just because that all gets stored in your history. Uh, the reason to use post to request there would be one, to fit the standard, and two, because um, the request body gets embedded into the request rather than in the header. Uh, put and delete also have request bodies. Get does not. <coughs> all of them can do this question mark equals cats. And I'll let you look up in the documentation how you would get at these variables. Any other questions? All right, let's check out the assignment. So in this assignment, I provided a good amount of boilerplate code for you, which means you have a skeleton of what you're going to actually code. First is a package.json, which we talked about in the morning. So what, what, talk me through what's going on here. Line two is what? Name, which is what? Yeah, it's just like the name of our thing. Uh, then what? Version number. Why might that version number be important?
So what happens if we decide to refactor what used to be our API earlier, where we had slash get coin state and slash flip coin, and we're like, all right, now we're going to change it to more fit this REST API standard. How does the user know, uh-oh, I can't use this anymore? Because of that version number. The version number is saying, hey, back, this is the old state of it in version 0.0.0. .0. We had an endpoint called get coin state and slash flip coin. But we changed that on you, and so we're also changing the version number. So you know if you're using version 0.0.0 .0 of our API, you can use these endpoints. But in version 0.1.0, .0, it's actually slash coin. How about private true? Yeah? When you change your version, like what warrants a change? Um, pretty much any time you republish your code. So if you have a small bug fix, usually that increments the third number. Um, if you have, if you're adding functionality or something like that, you change the middle number. If it's like a big design change, then you'll change the first number. And they always go up. And so you see this convention in almost everything. Um, like iOS 10.2.0. And then if they fix a bug, it becomes iOS 10.2.1. And then it was a big change from iOS 9 to 10, right? You had to like go through this upgrade. It looks all different. And so instead of changing the middle number, the last number, they changed the big first number. And so this is a convention that almost all software follows. Um, and then what about line 5? Exactly. So I'm planning on using these. I'm using Express. I'm planning on using Body Parser and Morgan. Um, and so these are, th I'm just saying, hey, by the way, I'm going to use these packages. So if you want to run my application, you have to install these packages. How do we install the packages? Anyone? NPM, right? right? You don't have to go to the internet, Google Body Parser, find that version, download that version, install it on your computer. You just do npm install, and it'll do that all automatically for you. So that's why package managers are so great. Cool. And now we have this practice REST API. So you guys, with your partners, will get to create a whole API from scratch. Um, and so I have some boilerplate for you, code for you, but nothing really that does any of the logic yet. <coughs> and so at the top four lines, we're just importing those NPM packages that we installed. Um, path allows us, actually, I don't think I even use path. Morgan allows us to log requests. So um, if you run this and then submit a request, it'll tell you at the console, like, hey, there was a request to slash get. It took this many milliseconds to send back a response. Here was the status code that we sent them. And so that just helps for debugging and seeing what requests are coming through and stuff. Um, body parser parses the JSON in, a bar in the body and allows you to use that rec.body variable. Um, var app equals express creates a new instance. Uh, ID tracker is part of this function I wrote for you that creates new user IDs. Um, and then, of course, line 10, 12, and 13 is what, what concept that we saw earlier from this lecture. It's a long word. Middleware, right? And so we're using logger dev, which is every single time we get a request, go ahead and log to the console, some debugging info that might be helpful. 12 and 13, we're creating rec.body for every single request. And then we get down to the meat of the application. Your database, line 22. And so for our database, we are choosing to use an array. What might be great and what might be horrible about this database? First, what's great about this database? How long does it take you to go look something up in a database? Do you have to send a request all the way to a server in North Carolina? No, right? It's just stored here. So you get lookup like that. What else is great about this database?
not really anything else. <laughs> that's like that's nice, but what's potentially bad about this database? Yeah, it's all stored in RAM, so if you have not very much RAM and you have a lot of users, then it's going to get expensive because you're going to have to get bigger servers. What else? Mm -hmm. So array.push will allow you to create, just push things. So in C, you had to malloc space for an array, but in higher level languages like JavaScript, they come with the prototype with .push, and you can just add things like that. What's particularly horrendous about this database? Well, that's that's bad about how we set it up, but takes. Um, yeah. So there's one we, yeah. There are no indexing, so we have to linear search for every single thing, uh, which is definitely definitely bad. But what's horrendous? Horrendous. I'll give you a hint. What happens when we restart our server? Yeah, it's not saved anywhere. So if we reset our server, we're back to this database. And so if our server crashes, then bye-bye all of our users. So this is something I would not recommend doing in real life. Um, because every time you add functionality, you have to restart your server, and then all of your data disappears. But it's fine for what we're trying to do. Um, I have a function, line 17. What do you think that does? <coughs> yeah, so each user has with it a unique ID. And remember, we need to have an identifier with each object so that we know that we can access the exact object that we want to. And so for that, we're using the ID. Um, and so I created this function. It took me forever to write, but um, you just call it, and it gives you a new unique user ID. And so what are you doing today? You get to create a REST API for your user's database, defined here. So clients should be able to create new users, get all the users, get a single user, update a user based on their ID, and delete a user also based on their ID. And so I want you to follow the REST practice and the way you set up your API. Um, and feel free to now use any built-in functions, including ES6 functions. So if you want to use let or const, or if you want to use each, you're welcome to do that. Um, but don't import any more external libraries, because you shouldn't need to. Everyone ready? Everybody feel prepared? Everybody think, oh, what did I get myself into? But you got this. Um, and if you f finish early, start adding more data validation. Start building it out even more. So like, don't insert values other than like what they should be in there. Cool, do you guys feel ready? Maybe? Yeah? All right. Um. <laughs>